James writes this letter and he addresses a specific group of individuals in the third chapter. And he's talking about taming the tongue. Yet he says, the tongue can no man tame. My question to you is then how do you deal with what you say? You're going to find out in this lesson. There are notes for this lesson as well. I'll leave a link in the description below. I'll leave a link above my head. Click that link, get your notes, get your Sunday school books and your Bibles for the Sunday school is now in session. Join me. Let's go. Hello, welcome to another edition of the Sunday School Lesson that's taught by Pastor Rodney Jones. I'm the pastor of the New Nation Anointed Ministries Church of God in Christ. We're located at 1700 West 87th Street in the city of Chicago, 60620. We go over the International Sunday School Lesson keywords and key phrases and verse by verse. Welcome to you new subscribers and thank you for subscribing to this channel. If you would like to be notified each week as we upload these lessons weekly, just make sure, if you can, click the subscribe button and make sure you click that bell notification right beside it so YouTube will notify you each week. Bing! Brad Jones just uploaded another lesson. I want to thank all of you for your condolences, for your cards, for your gifts of love, for even the checks that were sent in the mail or directly to me. Thank you for your support, especially in this hour of bereavement. Yes, within one year from August to August, both of my grandmothers made their transition and my mother, but I thank God that he's still on the throne. I wanted to take this time, I don't call out names because I'm uh, kind of uncomfortable with calling out their name, but I did receive it. And I want to thank you for your support and even for your patience. Uh, let's get into this lesson. This lesson is a very interesting lesson. I'm not going to really give it like I normally do because of the lateness of the hour and because of what we're still doing with both the family and the church. We're dealing with taming the tongue. This lesson is James the third chapter verses 1 through 12. This is August the 23rd, 2020. This is the International Sunday School lesson, and I will begin to go right into the lesson. James is talking to a group of individuals. Remember, we started out in the first chapter dealing with to count it all joy when you fall in diverse temptations. And he was right into the 12 tribes of Israel that had already been scattered because of the persecution that took place among the people of God. There were probably new converts, and this could be the first group. We're not sure, but uh, uh, it was going on. And remember I said this before, that the church has always grown even under oppression or under uh, a lot of stress and persecution. The church still grows. And so this week's lesson, James is addressing a group of individuals who not have been called but who has a desire to be teachers. I must let you know, everyone cannot teach. I understand you're faithful. I understand you're loyal. I understand you're there before the doors open. I even understand you have keys to the church, but that does not mean that you were called by God to teach. Verse one, my brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we should receive the greater condemnation. So problems existed in the early church because of false teachers. Everybody wanted to be a teacher in James's day and even in the day that we're living in now. And so the false teachers were teaching about faith outside of works. 
Last week, I prayed that we dealt with the word works properly. The word works was differently used by Paul. Paul and James used the word works differently. Paul addressed the word works. He was talking about the works of the law. There is no salvation in performing the works of the law. Last week's lesson, James was talking about the word works, which means the good deeds. These good deeds are produced by your salvation. In other words, now that you're saved, there is a good deed. There is things that you begin to do. Look at Jesus who went about doing good. The Bible said because God was with him. He was moved with uh, uh, feelings of hurt and pain that he saw that took place in the lives of other people. And therefore, he was moved, the Bible said, with compassion. So we dealt with the word works and faith without works is dead. However, these teachers were teaching the opposite. And therefore, I believe is why James had to bring that to the forefront of this lesson. So these false teachers were teaching the opposite things and the wrong things. And uh, James once again calls his audience, my brethren. And one of the reasons why is because he always identified with them. And also part two, each time that he transitioned or went to another conversation, another letter, another chapter, another whatever, he still continued to call them my brother, regardless of what was going on. Uh, and I'm going to leave that alone. I'm going to keep on moving. Point number five, he tells them not to become teachers and then he gives them a reason why. He uses the word be not, be not. We're going to talk about that in a minute. He includes himself in this greater condemnation of teachers if they did not teach what is right. He says teachers shall receive the greater condemnation or the greater judgment. My question to the class is, why are teachers going to receive the greater judgment? And number two, who's going to be the ones that's given them this judgment? You look at the word condemnation, it is the results of judgment. It is, to, uh, it is the judging, it is the sentence of judging. It is the sentencing or sentencing. I create words, don't worry about it. Uh, 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 so when teachers teach false doctrines and follow others or others follow them, they will be judged by this. To teach is to instruct God's people how to do something. And teachers literally take the scriptures and breaks it down to the smallest molecule and then presents it back into the lives and the laps of the students. That's what I'm talking about. But what he says is be not many masters. And the word be means to become or to come into existence. And the way James is using this, it's really a command. Uh, be not, literally it reads become not, become not. Uh, taking the office too hastily or don't do this of your own accord. He's telling them do not become teachers or masters. The word masters is the word teacher or instructor, or it means to teach. Uh, um, many in James's day uh, were self-made teachers, but they were self-made teachers for the wrong purposes. They knew that the teachers were highly respected. They were honored. They were looked up to. They were men of great honor and authority and power and prestige. Teachers had the authority to correct others. Who won't want, who don't want that opportunity to be able to correct others from a standpoint of a teacher. And then because you are a teacher, it brings the honor and the pomp and circumstances though. Therefore you're able to correct others. And then they come to attention and change or mend the error of their ways. As some teacher used to say it because they got it from the teacher. Teachers affect the whole entire world when they teach. And teachers will be judged by a higher standard in the body of Christ. And teachers are accountable to everything they teach. No wonder James says, don't all of you all become teachers. Don't be so swift to become teachers because of the great responsibility. Because if you have a false teacher, it's gonna ruin your church, your Sunday school class, whatever. I know she's your wife, I'm sorry, she's not qualified. Yep, 
He's your uncle. He's not qualified because he has not been called by the Lord and gifted by Jesus Christ per Ephesians 4, 11 and 12. Verse 2. He says, for in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same as a perfect man and able also to bridle the whole body. James gives the reason why he told them not to become teachers. So the main reason is that they were not called, first of all, to become teachers. And then the second reason why he says is because as humans, we offend. Now, he uses the word we offend all. He's not saying we offend everybody, though you li you're reading the King James Version. What he is saying is we all offend. And another word for offend means to stumble, to fall or to err or even to fail in duty. So he says, don't be so swift to become self-made teachers because we all stumble. We all fall. We all offend all of us. Yet, he says, if you are able not to offend in word, then you are a perfect man and you're also able to bridle your whole body. So if any man does not offend in word, notice he said in word, because a teacher is an individual who opens up their mouth and speak. If any man does not offend in his speech or in his tongue, he is perfect. If any man knows how to watch what he says, he is perfect. I call it open mic. Many times we preachers and teachers or whatever the case may be, we get up and whatever comes to our mind, that's what we speak and we cannot do it. We've got to be very discreet with the words that we speak. I'm a poet and didn't know it. Come on, somebody. We've got to be very discreet with what we say, how we say it, and when we say it. Paul said everything is not, all things is not expedient. It's not always expedient for you to say what you want to say. Make sure that whatever you say, it gives life and not brings death. So James didn't say that the man had to offend, but that if any man does not offend, uh, this man is a perfect he has the ability to keep his body under subjection. This perfect man is able to bridle his whole body all because he's able to keep what he says. And the word bridle means self-restraint. If he can keep his tongue, he got control over his whole body. The word perfect means to be finished, that which has reached its end. It means to be complete or to be full. So people who cannot control what they say don't need to be teachers. Teaching is not a self-promoted position, but it is a gifting. That's Ephesians 4 verses 11 and verses 12. Verse 3 and 4. Behold. We put bits in the horse's mouths that they may obey us. And we turn about their whole body. Note the word whole body again. Verse four says, behold, also the ships, which though they be so great and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about. There's the word about with a very small helm with the the governor listed. Now, James enters into uh, examples that his readers are familiar with. He uses the fact that man is able to control anything he wants to control. Man controls big objects by using small things in comparison to the gigantic object that he is controlling. Both of these are turned about. The ship is turned about and the horse is turned about by man, not of his own accord, not of his own will, but by man. Man put bits in the horse's mouth to cause the horse to obey the man. He puts a bridle on him, and then this thing has bits that he places in this horse's mouth. When he pull this way, it kind of gives a pressure, and the horse turns. When he does that way, the horse turns. When he does that, the horse does that, and the horse understands either turn right, turn left, or stop. 
He understands that. Then man puts bits in the horse's mouth to cause the horse to obey him, and he forces the animal to turn in his own direction, and the horse is not of his own accord, not of his own will at this point, but somebody else is giving him a command and telling him what to do. And this big gigantic horse who is bigger than the man, man takes a small object and put it in the horse's mouth and man goes from New York to Mississippi riding a horse with bits in his mouth regardless of how big the horse is there's nothing much that he can do technically against this small man who's riding him because man controls him by a small matter i'm going somewhere with that example number two is a ship that's way bigger than man this ship is tossed to and fro the bible said by fierce winds Yet man causes the ship to turn about with a small helm. Now he talks about the governor. The governor is the man. He has control of the helm. The helm controls the ship, which is in the water, which is really has a fierce wind, which normally sets the course and the direction of a ship. But because man has a helm, he forces the ship to go in that direction and James uses the word fierce wind to me for a double example and what he's really alluding to from what I see it is regardless of how fierce the wind is man still controls the direction of the ship with the helm so regardless of how fierce the circumstance, how hot the situation is that we're in, we ought to still be able to control what we say. It's not based on the situation, it's based on who you are, how you handle the situation. Verse five, even so the tongue is a little member, it's a little member and both of great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. So like the examples of small things controlling great things, the tongue is a small thing. James says that the tongue is a little member in relation to the whole body. That tongue is a little member. As the helm and the bit control the ship and the horse, the tongue sets the direction of the entire body. If a man can control his tongue, he can control his entire body. Bro, you ain't got to always give a piece of your mind. My daddy says that's all you got anyhow is a piece. Mm. Ooh, if man watches what he says, he can stay out of trouble. Shut it down by not opening up your mouth. Choose your battle. So he says the tongue, it boasts his great things. The word boast means to brag, to bear one's self loftily in speech or action boasteth this tongue is a small thing but it makes grand speeches we brag with this little old bitty tongue and we can't do nothing so the tongue sets the direction of an entire church the tongue kindleth a fire so the tongue improperly used can start a serious fire the New Living Translation says, a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. Many fires, forest fires start from a little match. To kindle means to light up or to produce fires. Verse 6, and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature and is set a fire of hell. Now the New Living Translation says, and among all the parts of the body, the tongue is a flame of fire. It is a whole world of wickedness, corrupting your entire body. It can set your whole life on fire, for it is set on fire by hell itself. And many writers are kind of confused with what James is really saying. So I'm not going to go so deep on it because we have to understand something. We're reading King James, who's four or five hundred years old. And sometimes the things that we talk about, the illustrations and the images that we use 
uh, were not used back in that day. You don't believe it? Go to the book of Revelation and you'll see some stuff. It's why it's sometimes it's kind of hard. But the, the writers understood the readers and the readers understood the writers. We're reading some mail that is over thousands of years old. So he says the tongue is four things, basically. It is a little member. It boasteth great things. It is a fire and it is a world of iniquity. Like we say, oh, you're in a world of trouble. These are possible activities if the tongue is not curbed. The tongue is a fire. Uh, James could possibly be talking about the negative usage of the tongue. When the wrong person uses the tongue, it can be as a fire. When a person who has not been sent by God to teach, teaches the wrong things, it can start a forest fire. Many organizations and ministries and businesses and whatever will shut down because the wrong person opened up the mouth at the wrong time. So when the teacher offends people, do the lack of control of the tongue or due to the lack of the control of the tongue, it can be a fire. The tongue is a world of iniquity. Uh, the tongue in comparison to the whole body is a world by itself. It's as if it's in a different category and literally and really it is. When that tongue is used improperly, it is a whole world of iniquity or iniquity. Matthew 15 and 11 says, Not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth, this defiles a man. What comes out of your mouth, what you speak and what you say is what defiles you. Proverbs 16 and 27 says, An ungodly man diggeth up evil. And his lips, or in his lips, there is as a burning fire. Point number four, he says, the tongue defileth the whole body. And the word defile means to spot, or it is a spot. It is a stain. Figuratively, it is in a moral sense. It defiles the body. The tongue stains or pollutes the whole body. Every part of of the life of the body is affected by the tongue when used wrongfully. Your tongue can get you killed. Your tongue can cause you to be punished, afflicted with pain. Your tongue can cause you to be healed. Why not use the goodness of the tongue and speak only blessings and not cursings? The tongue sets on fire the course of nature. And he says, and it is set on fire of hell. Somebody going to tell me what was he talking about now. It could be because of the fact that the individual who uses the tongue is inspired from the individual who we say is in hell, though actually he's lurking around. Uh, that could be what he's talking about because anything that's not good is bad. Anything bad is rooted and take its roots in the, the, the devil. Uh, uh, Y'all understand what I'm saying. I'm going to leave that alone. Hmm. Colossians 4 and 6 says, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how ye ought to answer every man. Ephesians 4 and 29, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Verses 7 and 8. For every kind of beasts and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Man tames the beast. In the field, he tames the wild beasts, he tames birds, he tames serpents, he tames the animals, or whatever you might call them, that's in the sea. Man tames everything that's really on earth, the lions, the tigers, and the bears, oh my, have been tamed by man, but the tongue no man can tame. Why? Because it is an unruly evil. The word tame means to reduce 
to stillness or quietness. You can't tame yourself to shut down your mouth. Your mouth just got to open up and curse somebody. You got to open up and give you a piece of, of your mind. Uh, he says it is unruly. The tongue is unruly means it is untamable. Hmm. It means not to be restrained. You can't restrain the tongue. We brag so much, we make rockets go to the moon. We make lions sit down and purr like a kitten. We make a serpent or a snake come out of a barrel and dance to my music, but you can't shut your mouth up. Mm. Come on, somebody. Now I'm gonna say this. He said man cannot tame it, but man who is used by the Holy Spirit can control because it's coming from. He says no man can tame it. And I believe he's also saying can't no one else tame my tongue. You can tame a ship, but someone else cannot tame me. Yet when I give my life over to the Lord and allow the Holy Spirit to minister and to speak through me, I'm only going to speak what he tells me to speak. I will stay out of trouble. No, you cannot tame me, but I don't have to use an excuse that I'm human and that's why I couldn't hold my tongue. Oh, you can hold it. You can restrain it from saying negative things. You don't believe it? Go to court and see don't you restrain yourself from some things before he holler, Bailiff! <laughs> therewith, verse 9, bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brother, these things ought not to be. So with that tongue and with that mouth, we bless God, we praise God, we enter into worship with God. But that same tongue, that same mouth, and many people with the same breath curse men. And men is made after the similar to or in the likeness of God. You're really still cursing God in a way because you're cursing someone that he made per Genesis after his likeness and after his image. He said, out of the same mouth proceeds blessing, out of that same mouth proceeds cursing. But look at what he said, my brother, these things ought not to be. Now, if he can say it ought not to be, that must mean I don't have to do it. If he can tell me it ought not to be. Come on, somebody. I'm going to keep reading. Verse 11 and verse 12. Doth the fountain send forth at the same time or the same place, sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brother, bear olive berries, either a vine, figs? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. He gives more illustrations. He talks about the fountain and he talks about the fig tree. They cannot only but produce. I can't say that again. They can only produce what it is made of. If it's a fig tree, it cannot produce berries. If it's a bear tree, it cannot produce figs. If it's wa fresh water, it cannot produce salt water. If it's a salt water, it cannot produce fresh water. It can only produce what it is. How is it that man can produce both out of the same mouth and even at the same time? My brethren, he says, it ought not to be. So James uses more familiar illustrations to his readers to further prove a point. Look at what he said about the tongue. Number one, it's a little member, verse five. It boasts of great things, verse five. It is a fire. It is the world of iniquity. It defileth the whole body. It setteth on fire the course of nature, verse six. It set on fire of hell. The tongue can no man tame. It is unruly. It is full of deadly poison. We bless God with it and we curse men with it. The tongue, ladies and gentlemen, the tongue. Now, I got some notes here, uh, and I'm going to read this, and then I'm done. Teachers cannot say any and everything that comes to their minds, that negative, because it produces a negative effect. Teachers should and must choose the words that they use. Uh -huh. uh, teachers must have positive attitudes and teach with proper attitudes. 
teachers' lives should live up to their teachings. Mm -hmm. A skilled teacher can build the character of his or her student by the words that they speak. The tongue cannot be tamed by man, but man can submit himself to the spirit. And teachers must be careful uh, as to what they teach. And your teaching affects others, either positive or negative. And the information you give must be precise and on point, Danielson. If you're going to give this information, make sure you understand and you know what you're talking about. You are teaching truths concerning God's word, not emotions, not feelings, not what I believe, so to speak, but what you have gotten from the scripture. Context is key and context is everything and so is content. Uh, so teachers can lead or mislead people or their students. And teachers were men of great authority. They had the highest honor and the highest respect. Mm -hmm. The position of teaching is a position of accountability. And the key word is teaching. This is a very good lesson. And we got one more lesson to go. Then we're going to shift. And I'm praying that the Lord will give me the strength to be able to do what I need to do, make some changes, because I'm trying to shift and get back on track. I uh, thank you. Someone wrote me an email and told me that they understood the heaviness that I'm undergoing as a pastor. That blessed my heart. I read emails. You're welcome to send your emails. You can send it uh, Rodney Jones Sunday School at gmail.com. Or you can do it through self. But that bless my heart. Many times people don't understand what we do as pastors when we have to teach and preach uh, weekly and the amount of studying that we have to do. And so, but I thank God. If you like these lessons, give me a thumbs up. As my brother would say, smash that thumbs up button until it turns another color. I don't know if he's talking about the thumb on your hand or the thumb on the YouTube screen and share this video with somebody. Perhaps it may be effective enough to touch someone's lives. Uh, leave some descriptions. Come on, let's let's talk about this lesson. What is it that you like about, dislike about this lesson? What questions do you have on the floor or whatever the case may be? Let's let's talk about it. Let's chat about teachers. And have you been called by God to teach? How comfortable are you at teaching? A lesson. Let's talk teacher talk and let's get prepared to have a teacher's talk per um, um, whatever they call these other uh, YouTube and Facebook and, and Zoom. Yes, yes, I'm getting ready to do a Zoom for, for teachers and we're just gonna talk and just do a QA session. Remember my motto teaching the Word of God in the spirit of excellence and the model of a Sunday school a child saved is a soul saved plus a life. Amen.